Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 627 of the podcast and it is Friday the 10th of June 2022 as I record this. On today's show, I talk to Brian Cohen, who many of you will know from the Sell More Book Show. So Brian recently did a Kickstarter and has another one coming up soon at kickyouremail.com. So I ask for his tips and lessons learned on crowdfunding. Plus, we talk about how his career has developed since we've known each other for almost a decade now and how he has scaled his various streams of income, including tips for hiring freelancers, which frankly is the only way to scale because there are only so many hours in one day. So if you're interested in doing a Kickstarter, then definitely also listen to episode 614 with Monica Lionel. So the interview with Brian coming up in the interview section. So in publishing and book marketing news, well, lots on audio today. So first of all, good news from the Audio Publishers Association, the APA, as reported by Publishing Perspectives. It has been the 10th year, or 2021 was the 10th year of double-digit growth for audiobook sales in the United States. And one interesting statistic said 61% of parents say their children listen to audiobooks, compared to 35% measured in 2020. So that's 35% up to 61% of parents saying their kids listen. And this has been attributed to school disruption in the pandemic. But think about that, a whole new generation of audio listeners. And Personally, I remember lying in bed when I was about 11 or 12 listening to The Prisoner of Zender on tape. I can still, I literally, I can still hear it now in my head. And uh, Flavia, (laughs) I remember that so well. And I used to get these tapes from the library and that definitely shaped the audio consumer I am today. So I just think of all these kids who've picked up audio in the pandemic and that's just brilliant. So positive news there. Although, of course, the other formats still outsell audio. It's just one of the many options for listeners and readers. But again, as ever, I'm as certainly as an audiobook consumer, I also buy uh, the, I often buy the hardback edition of, with the audio or the ebook because I want to refer to the text as well. So uh, all, big news really, I think this week is that Spotify had their investor day this week. The overall theme was their vision to become the world's creator platform. So yeah, I mean, they are super ambitious. So uh, I'm, I'm linking in the show notes to their Spotify newsroom. Uh, it's really interesting read. I'm not going to talk about music and I'm not going to talk about podcasting. And they have loads of stuff on that. So if you're in the music industry as well, or if you're a podcaster, <laughs> like me, then you'll be interested in the rest of this report. But I'm going to focus on audiobooks. So first of all, they do talk about our future extends beyond music and podcasting, a reality where 50 million artists, writers, labels, publishers, studios and other creators will be able to manage their businesses and monetize and effectively promote their work to more than 1 billion users. At the centre is a set of software, services, products and business models tailored for specific verticals and bundled into a single single consumer experience, the Spotify machine. They might come up with a different word there, but specific verticals, of course, one of which it will be audiobooks and presumably also verticals by genre bundled into a single consumer experience. And I use the Spotify app, so I get that. So they had lots of sessions on all these other things, music, podcasting, etc. And one session on audiobooks. So remember, Spotify bought Findaway in late 2021, the parent company of Findaway Voices, who many of us use, I use it, awesome service that enables us to find narrators and publish audio wide, which I highly recommend. So in the session on audiobooks, they said, By introducing streaming technology to podcasting, Spotify helped create audio experiences that were not possible before. Like with music and podcasting, we see an extraordinary opportunity to invest, innovate and grow audiobooks. 
the vertical holds massive possibilities to build on our ambition to be the destination for a wide array of creators. The global size of the book market is estimated to be around 140 billion US dollars. That's inclusive of printed books, ebooks and audiobooks, with audiobooks having only a 6 to 7% market share. But when you look at the most penetrated audiobook markets, and a lot of those are here in Europe, um, Sweden, I think, uh, the Baltic states, it's actually closer to 50% of the market. So call that an annual opportunity of around $70 billion for us to expand and eventually compete for. And I totally agree with that. I mean, my consumption is certainly 50% (laughs) for sure. And it it is really interesting. These markets where it's almost audio before ebook is fascinating. Again, this is not going to get rid of print, ebook, other things, NFTs when they arrive. Uh, but I think it's very, very exciting. I, I, You can probably hear I'm so excited about this. I've been waiting for this. So going on, they say, we plan to build on Findaway's expertise and infrastructure to deliver tools and resources that will lower the barriers to entry and enable creators to find an audience, expanding the audiobook market overall, just as we did with podcasting. And of course, they I believe they've overtaken Apple in a lot of markets. To achieve that scale, we'll amplify the growth of Findaway's platform offering, currently called Findaway Voices. This platform connects independent authors and publishers with independent voice actors and manages the production and distribution of their audiobooks. This creates an exciting new channel of scaled creation with the potential to quickly grow the audiobooks market. Lots of mention of the word independent there, which I think is good. An exciting new channel, scaled creation, quickly grow. These are all good buzz words. So yes, from a personal perspective, I heard one of the Spotify executives at Frankfurt Book Fair, probably four, five years ago now, it's crazy. Uh, and I was so impressed by their incredible AI personalization algorithm for audio that I moved my own consumption over to Spotify for that reason I wanted to understand it as a consumer and I've actually been bugging Will at Findaway Voices for years now about getting audiobooks onto Spotify so obviously this is now coming and hopefully given that it is June 2022 I really hope I mean it's got to come within the next year they've got to be with the investor day of course they can't have an investor day in in a year's time and say oh we just forgot that entire section (laughs) so I would say this this must be coming uh, sooner than well hopefully the end of the year there's nothing about timings in this report by the way I'm just uh, hoping <laughs> now many of you will now be worrying you'll be saying oh no but streaming and subscription models push digital revenue to zero and look to be honest yes it does push it in that direction and uh, in fact uh, Orna Ross and I talked about this on the Ask Ally podcast a while back we did a whole session on subscription models for audio and how things are changing and obviously we've seen it with KU it pushes the uh, digital sales is very very different so it's a different business model basically but um the revenue share for creators for musicians obviously has been highly reported but I think we have to change our mindset as ever <laughs> Spotify to me is about a small revenue stream, probably, most likely a smaller revenue stream, but it is a huge marketing platform, a global marketing platform. It's in over 180 countries, I think. And I intend to use it as a lead generation, a bit like, I mean, you guys, you, you, some of you are listening right now on Spotify and you may have found me on Spotify and heard, heard, you know, listen to the show there. And I want to bring this as lead gen into my direct sales in the creator economy. But also think about it with the podcast. I really hope they have a sort of creator. If I I want you to be able to click on my name and then find my audiobooks, for example. And then I want to bring you back to my hub and I will have other premium products. So I'm going to be releasing audio only, not audiobooks. There'll be audio only sort of mini courses. I don't know what to them. I don't want to call them lectures, but I'm still trying to come up with a good word. But they'll essentially, they won't be books. They will be only audio only products, which I won't put on any other platform. So I'm super excited as ever (laughs) about the creator economy and how Spotify will come into that. I'm almost ready to share with you the whole creator economy design. I'm still thinking about it. I will be um, obviously this weekend coming up. Oh, I'll come back to that in a minute. I want to stay with the news in this section. Okay, so 
still on audio and find your way voices in June 2022, which is now, as you're hearing this, uh, if you're listening to this in reasonably soon, uh, Find Your Way Voices has a whole load of free webinars for Audiobook Month on craft and marketing for audio. Check it out at findawayvoices.com forward slash audiobook month 2022. And I'll again, links in the show notes, but I imagine that they'll record those and use those. You'll be able to listen to them later. So yeah, so findawayvoices.com forward slash audiobook month 2022 for a whole load of free webinars. Looks really good. Also, I wanted to say thank you for listening because because of all this, I went and checked the stats and uh, the Creative Pen podcast has now had over 7 million downloads on the audio feed alone. And that is across 228 countries. 60% of the listenership is in the USA, 12% UK and then Australia, Canada, Germany and everywhere else. And uh, it also goes out on YouTube and a whole load of places that don't get measured, but I don't count those in my stats. So yes, 7 million downloads. Thank you for listening. I appreciate you uh, listening to the show. Also on AI, thanks to listener John Say, who sent me an article after the AI narration episode, uh, which was episode 623. I go into AI narration and AI for voice. But uh, Fortune reported and a whole load of other sides reported that Val Kilmer's voice in Top Gun Maverick was AI generated. And if you've seen it, you'll know, uh, I mean, Val Kilmer basically had throat cancer and his voice is essentially, I think it's gone. And uh, they generate, he does do a bit of typing in the movie but he then speaks and apparently he was just thrilled with it so I think that's brilliant and the article which I'll link to in the show notes goes into the company Sonantic who do this kind of thing and it's really really interesting article and talking of Top Gun Maverick I I wanted to talk about it because we went to the cinema like literally the first time we went to the cinema in years not just because of the pandemic but we had stopped going to the cinema basically and just watch streaming um you know amazon prime and and all of that um not uh, netflix and things now it is a really really good movie so i'm just going to say that i'm not particularly uh well no, just not a top gun super fan in any way not a tom cruise super fan either but uh it was a really good movie <laughs> so <laughs> i think you it, you you could see it and enjoy it if you enjoy action movies which i do but it also had a good emotion. And I wanted particularly to talk about it for nostalgia reasons. So there's so much nostalgia going around at the moment. So the Top Gun movie, they do music harking back to the original. They do. And it came out in 1986, by the way, some something around then. And maybe you were born in that year. <laughs> My sister was born that year. So, I mean, it's kind of crazy to think that long. Tom Cruise doesn't look that much different, to be honest. But they do some of the similar um, similar shots with, you know, the motorbike, the beach volleyball, some of the, you know, the, the setup is the same. So they kind of hark back to the original in a very, very clever way. And it brought up all this nostalgia. And music definitely does that. Uh, so more nostalgia that's going on. Stranger Things, if you've been watching that, brilliant latest series featured Kate Bush's song Running Up That Hill. Again, amazing nostalgia for lots of us who were (laughs) listening to music back then. And it pushed that song into the charts uh, after 37 years. It's back in the charts. It just shows you how powerful nostalgia is. And here in the UK, we've had Derry Girls. uh, I mean, you can presumably watch it all over the place. I think that's on Netflix too. But yeah, Derry Girls, such a great series set in Northern Ireland in the 1990s. And every single song brought back a memory for me. That's sort of my age group. And there, there, there is in fact a Spotify playlist for Derry Girls, which I've been listening to. <laughs> and of course, we've also had the Queen's Platinum Jubilee here in the UK. And um, there are lots of TV shows looking back over the last 70 years, and um, which brings back memories, some good, some bad. So I wanted to bring it up because I've been feeling like quite emotional about this whole thing. And it's a very powerful emotion, nostalgia, super important. So how can we bring a sense of nostalgia into our books? I've been thinking about this and how I could possibly do that. Because of course, we can't quote song lyrics. Remember, you can't do that. It's a really, really, really bad idea unless you get specific permissions. Um, so and it is not fair use for for lyrics. Really, there isn't. <laughs> 
so don't do that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so here's a thought for you and a question this week. How can we bring nostalgia into our books? So in my personal update, yes, so this weekend, uh, I, this is the Friday before the weekend. By the time this goes out, it will have happened. But um, I'm running a creator economy event with Orna Ross. We're co-presenting this weekend, um, which is a really good match. If you listen to Orna and I on the Ask Alloy podcast, where we have, a, we think similarly in many ways, but we are so different in our presentation style. I am, <laughs> you might have noticed, sometimes I can be a bit of a fire hose <laughs> of information and my brain moves at speed and I try and communicate at speed. Orna is a very, very gifted creative facilitator. So what tends so basically our rhythm is I present and just fire hose at people and then she takes over and helps people figure out what they actually want from my fire hose. <laughs> So we're a really good team. But this is the first full day event, actually in-person event, I have personally run for five or six years. Uh, the last one I actually ran was with Orna in London. Yeah, it was like six years ago. And it is a lot of work to run your own events and speak at them. Normally, I'm a you know professional speaker. I get paid to speak at events and, of, of course, do some online. But I wanted to do this because I want to see if I can do more in Bath. And also my one of my themes for this year and possibly forever now is more physical, more digital. So even as we do more online and, you know, as I and I talk about a lot of the online stuff, I want to recognize that the importance of being a real person in person and so you know this is really me I'm actually a person I'm not just a voice I'm not just a AI assisted author I'm not just global digital scalable all of that I am actually real and podcasting helps and yes this is still the real me this is not an AI voice <laughs> but I also think being physically present at a live event is a good idea it cannot be replicated online and I will be recording my my sessions at some point uh, as I was talking about before I'll be recording it as some kind of special audio program and I'll be selling that direct and we may or may not run this event again we shall see but I will certainly be sharing my information at some point but uh, yeah this will be the first live event in ages so I'll tell you how it goes I yeah, I'm kind of apprehensive in a way because I get so, so tired. Uh, I, But I maybe things have changed. As I said, it's been six, six, five, six years, but it is essentially a full day. A lot of people, well, not a lot of people. We've actually got, we've got 35, I think. So nice size group, really. Yeah, so anyway, that's happening. I've also got How to Write a Novel back from my editor. So I'll be working on that after this weekend is done. And that I will also be selling direct for a month. Uh, and then after I, I'm just finishing up my slides for the event. And then I'm also speaking at SPS Live, the self-publishing show live. I know many of you listen to um, Mark and James and guests over at Self Publishing Show and I'm speaking at their event on the creator economy but I'll only have like 40 minutes rather than a whole day <laughs> so yeah that will be a small a small section I'm still intending to be at 20 Books Vegas in November and uh, hopefully also speaking on the creator economy and superstars in February with the lovely Kevin J Anderson and others in Colorado so I do hope to meet more of you in person over the coming year and I may well run more events in Bath not sure yet so if you also in if you enjoy Orna and I talking about things check out the latest Ask Ally podcast in our monthly advanced self-publishing salon our topic this month is transitions endings and new beginnings and we talk a lot about how to cope with change when these things are out of your control so something happens in the market and you're affected and it's just you have to you have to transition like the the pandemic you know we had to change a lot of things but also when do you know when you need to end something or when you need to transition into something new so it's a really interesting discussion and as ever the long term perspective I also wanted to mention The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel, which I did actually mention a couple of years ago when it came out, but uh, I just re-listened to it again on audiobook. I always like to listen to things like The Psychology of Money when the markets are in flux. And if you are aware of, you know, the 
stock market and the economy and crypto and all of that, everything's down. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> so yes, it's kind of good to think about the emotional aspects of money and just recenter if you get anxious. So that's what I do. If, when I get anxious about money, I listen to things like The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel and I feel better. Uh, and as ever, I've got books at thecreativepen.com forward slash money books if that's something you're feeling. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. Randy said, I'm listening to the episode about newsletters and reader magnets. Very good content. I live in Pawleys Island, South Carolina. Like you, I lift and I listen to you when I'm doing my strength training. Hi, Randy. And in fact, I was strength training this morning. I was deadlifting and I actually had a bit of a breakthrough today. So I'm in a very good mood. <laughs> uh, Matthew Rary says, I hope that's okay, Matthew. I said, uh, said, where I'm listening to the show, one of the best writing podcasts, thank you, Matthew, in Seattle, and sent some great pictures over the city. I definitely have to come to Seattle at some point, for sure. And Elizabeth Cool uh, sent a picture of her smiling face alongside her serval, beautiful serval cat, Jericho. Just lovely. So remember, you can tweet me at the creative pen, the double N. Send me pictures of where you're listening. I love to see where you are in the world. Or email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com or leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So today's show is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. KWL was built by authors for authors and their team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help you reach new readers around the world. Kobo's author first approach is one of the reasons they developed a promotions tool. This is an easy and affordable way for you to market your book directly to Kobo readers. They offer lots of promotions that don't require you to drop your price because they know when you publish wide, it can be a pain to coordinate pricing across multiple retailers. Any promotions listed as a percent off, for example, a 40% VIP sale, means you don't have to change your price as the discount is done by a promo code at checkout. If that sounds good to you, keep an eye out for percent off promotions and buy more, save more sales, where you can submit your titles and leave the rest to Kobo. And if you're taking part in a promotion, be sure to tell your readers about it. The promotions tool is updated on a weekly basis, so make sure you're taking a regular look to see what's on offer and if there's an opportunity that matches your books and marketing plans. Now, just personally, I have a little reminder in my calendar that pops up every three weeks and, I, and it just says, go and submit to Kobo Promotions. And like literally, I just go in, I submit to everything I can and then I go back in again. And, you know, obviously you don't get every promotion you submit to, but to me, this is critical for driving sales on Kobo Writing Life. So please do this. So if you are a KWL author and don't yet have access to the promotions tool, email the team at writinglife at kobo.com. So that's writinglife at kobo.com. They will enable this for you. And of course, always mention the show. <laughs> that would be nice. If you want to learn more about KWL, check out the Kobo Writing Life podcast available wherever you're listening and find them on social. You can create your free account today at kobo.com forward slash writing life. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. And especially when I do the in between episodes, you pay for my brain to think about all this stuff. And then, of course, I bring it to you on the show. Thanks to new and returning patrons, Elizabeth Cool, Sarah and Wendy Haynes. And thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. It really does mean a lot to me. And thanks for those uh, continuing or increasing their pledge at this time. I completely appreciate it. If you would like to support the show, you can do it with just a couple of dollars or euros or pounds or whatever your currency is. And uh, you will get the extra Q&A monthly audio where I answer your questions about anything. And uh, it can be basic. It can be advanced. It can be personal. I generally answer everything. <laughs> so you can support the show at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash The Creative Pen. Right. Let's get into the interview. 
Brian Cohen is the author of Nonfiction and Superhero Fiction and the co-host of the Sell More Book Show. He's also the founder of Best Page Forward, which writes books, book descriptions for authors, and he teaches authors how to use Amazon ads more effectively. So welcome back to the show, Brian. Thank you for having me, Joe. I was looking, it's been five years and I'm oh. happy to be back. <laughs> Time flies, doesn't it? Does. It? Oh, it really does. does. But today we're going to focus on your multiple streams of income because I definitely think you are sort of author entrepreneur and I want to talk about a lot of that. But let's start with the Kickstarter. And uh, I okay. hit you up with an email and was like, oh, I need to know about your Kickstarter. So we're going to talk about that first. So you did this Kickstarter. It was on self-publishing with Amazon ads, which funded at over $20,000. Amazing. And it's over 600 backers. So tell us about the project and why did you go with the Kickstarter? Sure. Well, I've always really liked Kickstarter as a backer. I've funded multiple projects, multiple books, entertainment projects, and I've just really liked this idea that you can throw in perks because I think that as authors, we really get focused on this $2.99, $3.99 book And yes, we can sell enough copies of that to live on, but (laughs) we need to sell a lot of copies. And so this opportunity to reward your readers by giving them these extras is a really fun opportunity first and foremost, but it also allows you, hey, to maybe pocket a little extra cash than you would have when you are uh, just launching a low priced book. And so from a money in money out perspective, it's really nice to within uh, the end of the funding of a Kickstarter, a week or two, you actually have some money rather than waiting 60 days and change for Amazon and the other retailers to pay you. Right. So that's, I guess, one, the money side and two, you can give something extra. You can come up with extras. So how did the project go? (laughs) What were your lessons learned? Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. And I know we talked about this a little bit. There is a lot that goes into a Kickstarter. And I know you've spoken with uh, Monica Leonel, I think, and and Russell Nolte about the, the Kickstarters. And there's just a lot of planning. There's a lot of marketing that goes into this. And so I think even though I knew it would be a lot, even though I knew there would be uh, hours and hours of time that I needed to pour into this, I did not really budget for it. And and I think you and I have that in common sometimes. It's <laughs> just uh, we leap before we look and then, oh my goodness. Uh, so one of the biggest issues was just a lot of time had to go into making it the right kind of campaign at the beginning. And then at the end, and we're still kind of in the end, (laughs) is actually fulfilling all of those things that you promised to the backers. And so there's a lot of work on the front end, a lot of work on the back end. And then of course, in the middle, you have to get people to actually back the project. Well, uh, let's talk about two specific things. Then, first of all, these extras that you use in the campaign as the different reward levels. What are some of the things that you did in those extras, and I guess why why did that add time as well? Well, one of the things that you know all, all well about from your early days of publishing is you've got to uh, print out some books on your own through a fulfillment service of some kind rather than Amazon. If it, it, You don't have to do that, certainly. I wanted to make sure my backers received a book before anybody else in the world could. And so you could certainly get it printed on KDP Print or, or Ingram. I ended up going with a, a, a smaller company, Mixum, that was recommended to me by Monica, and they've been really great. But it's my first time ever printing out things from a public, <laughs> uh, from not from a uh, a fulfillment, not from a retailer, but from an actual printer. And so there were time constraints to think about in there. I also offered an audiobook, and I know you. This is all just the I should have listened to Joe and th- th- thought about episodes of the Creative Pen and said, oh, 
Maybe I shouldn't record my own audiobook. Oh, maybe I should plan more ahead. Audiobook, the printing, there, there are all these personal rewards I kind of threw in there, like phone call with Brian or a video from Brian. And and I I thought that just by saying I'm going to give these to these people, that it would give me the extra motivation to pull it off. But I'm already busy and already tired. So it, it was a struggle. It has been a struggle to get everything out to the people with all of those bonuses. And I think every Kickstarter creator should consider these things when setting up the campaign initially. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, that that special print run, it's both a really special thing because it's a special print run. But equally, like you said, we haven't really done it before. And, and I was looking to work with a partner on that. And But I just, in the end, I just felt like the work, the amount of work was too much for me. I also didn't want to do this spike marketing thing, which I, I just, I'm uncomfortable with. And mm-hmm. so I wanted to ask you about that too. So there is this period. So there's the pre-marketing, you have to tell people you're going to do a Kickstarter and get them to sign up for this sort of pre-launch page. And then you have the campaign. So what were the things that you did during that spike marketing phase? Sure, sure. And I, I, I didn't even think that that was what it was called, but it absolutely is a spike marketing phase. So I definitely let my email list know about it. I created a Facebook group uh, related to the campaign and I, I, all of the channels that I already do have on social media, on Facebook, on TikTok, I, I certainly let them all know about it. But I, I think a lot of it does come back to email since that's the percentage. You're going to get the best bang for your buck letting your email list know about it. So I both let my email list know about it and I made sure to run some targeted Facebook ads where I was targeting my own email list. And a lot of that was the uh, the buildup to the campaign, but I always made sure to go back to what has always worked best for me. I am a performer by nature, former improv comedian. And so I made sure to do a couple of webinars and I did a a big webinar to kick everything off. And I didn't push the actual launch campaign button until the moment I launched the campaign on the webinar so that it could get people excited while they were talking to me, while they were listening to me, and get them to actually take the action. So I made sure there was something that fit with my strengths in order to get folks in the door. Yeah, and I I know you can really bring the energy when you're up for it. <laughs> I know that's exactly like you said, that's your performance side of things. You can bring it. And that is it's I see your videos sometimes. I'm like, well, wow, Brian, Brian is so good at that stuff. And that again, <laughs> yeah. that's something I'm definitely not strong on. And of course, people can do it different ways. I mean, we're not saying that people have to do it your way or Monica's way. You can do it however you like. But obviously, your that project is is over, but you're gonna do another one. One. So presumably it wasn't that bad. So what are you, yeah. tell us about the next one and what will you do differently next time or how will you improve your experience of it? Oh, I definitely did learn a lot. And despite all of the craziness, yes, I did decide to do another one launching on June 2nd. And so it's already launched by this point, the magic of podcasting. It is a, a new book for authors called Self-Publishing and email marketing. And it is essentially the the book and the training on the email side of things on how to build up that email list, grow subscribers, get more reviewers from that. And so the campaign, I I definitely didn't want to do certain things from the first time. I, I almost treated the first campaign as, hey, I have these disparate things. I have the ad training for Amazon ads. I have uh, sales page improvements for best page forward, best page forward plus. Let's just throw all of that in there at different levels. But one of the things I learned from Monica that uh, and, and Russell was that if I was going to be promoting this thing based around a certain topic, it made sense for not just one funding level, not just a few funding levels, but all funding levels to actually fit with that 
theme. And so one thing I'm doing differently this time is every level is related to email. I'm not throwing in things related to the Amazon ads. I'm not throwing in things related to the other stuff I do. It's totally focused on email and the theme is pervasive throughout. So that's absolutely one of the major things that I'm doing. Well, then one of the fears, and I've heard from several people that their projects, they didn't even make money, like maybe they broke even, sometimes they were even out of pocket. And so this is another question. Did you find anything cost much more than you expected? So either those, because those print books, right, you don't, you can't do the print run until you've sort of finalized the project Mm -hmm. or sold out of that reward level. And that that's costing that we don't really understand. And then there's shipping, which can change. And there's a whole load of costs that are not under your control. Obviously your time is your time, but that you can, you you just keep working more, but were there any costs that, that ended up being higher than you expected? Well, I do think that the monetary cost when it comes to print, when it comes to hardcover, I I did expect that going in. I knew that it wasn't going to be like getting a proof from KDP print where uh, it might work out to a few dollars each. I knew it was going to be higher than that. I think my actual printing cost ended up being for, I think we printed 250 books uh, for paperback. And it was about $8.33 for each one, which I, I thought wasn't, wasn't terrible. And the shipping, we actually it did not include shipping. And so people had to enter an additional amount if they wanted to have, uh, if they wanted to do the paperback or hard covers. So I, I don't think if you plan ahead, if you have that people can pay for shipping up front, because you can do it so people don't pay for shipping until after the project, but then people feel blindsided with this extra cost. I don't think you want to do that to people. You want to be very upfront with it, but I really think beyond any monetary thing, the time and energy uh, costs involved with the campaign, like uh, recording my first audio book, which I honestly just finished yesterday, and (laughs) I'm very happy with it, but it, it it was a lot of energy. And then the certain things that I've, I, I had a lot of trouble getting fit into my schedule, that those were the hardest parts. And I think if you are as busy as me or Joe, you definitely need to think about how can you conserve your energy? How can you give a lot of value in your funding levels, but also make it easier on you And that is something I would definitely consider whenever creating a campaign. I mean, when I was planning mine, I almost, uh, because you have to say, when is this expected, Mm -hmm. uh, don't you? And I wonder if the answer um, is to just move your, you think, oh, I can do this by next month. If it's launching in June, July, I'll deliver it in August. And that's kind of how we're used to doing things as indie authors, because we're like, right. oh, well, I just upload the book and it's available tomorrow or the ebook's available now. And, and I almost wonder whether with these Kickstarters, it's better to add on a month or even two months to make sure that you've got enough time to deliver things according to people's expectations. Because I mean, I've funded projects that haven't arrived for like a year. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And a lot of backers expect expect that at this point, Kickstarter specific folks, they know they're not necessarily going to get things right away. It's readers who you're introducing to the platform who might think differently. I, I think the advice that Russell uh, Nolte gave me and that I'm following this time is to have the book finished before you launch the campaign. Mm. And this time around, I, I'm 11 out of 12 chapters in as we're recording this. But by the time we launch the campaign, the book will be finished and I'm going to put it in the hands of folks right at the conclusion. I mean, even though I we ran our campaign in November 2021 and I said, well, we will deliver the book by February. I still did not meet that. I ended up having to email everyone and say, Sorry, it's going to be an extra month. And it was only an extra month for the ebook. I had always said the paperback wasn't going to be until a couple months later. I knew because of paper shortages that 
not everything was going to be in my control, mm. but it, nobody minded. In fact, and my team really helped me out with this. They said, Brian, if you say that you were tired and tried your best and didn't quite get the deadline, these wonderful authors who follow you will empathize. And they oh, did. Yeah. Yeah, they I mean, really I ba- I backed it, and as far as I'm concerned, that that happens generally anyway. <laughs> so, right. so I think that's really good that you just gave yourself permission to do that, and we'll do it differently next time. But what I love about this model, and I mean, I may do one at some point, but I love that the mm-hmm. fact that you've now done this, but it's not the end. You now have another asset. So, what happens with the book next? Are you just going to publish everywhere else now? Yeah, that's the thing. I think you're absolutely right. I think this is what people are missing is that, okay, let's say I, I put a book out on Kickstarter and it's not, you make a modest amount, like $300. Well, <laughs> that's probably more than you would have gotten in 60 days if you'd launched it just onto Amazon or onto Amazon and the other retailers. But now you get to sell it to other people afterwards. So you bank that $300 and you get to sell it elsewhere. And not just on the other retailers. I am very, very interested in the direct sales model. I've been uh, really studying some folks and what they've been doing with platforms like Shopify. And I am starting to wonder, and this is you know, kind of me spilling the beans on what I've been thinking about (laughs) lately a lot. So you do a Kickstarter, you launch the book and all these extras, and you have to create these extras. But once they're made, they're made. And then you certainly launch the book on Amazon, Apple, Kobo, etc. But now you have all these extras. And you can use Kickstarter's uh, platform. Well, it's a Kickstarter, uh, uh, except I can't think of the right word. Accessory. Accessory. Mm. Yes. A Kickstarter accessory backer kit where you can actually sell those extras after the, after the Kickstarter is over, but then you could also sell those extras and the book directly on your website or on your Shopify store. So it's almost like Kickstarter ends up being this this almost loan. <laughs> it's almost like you're getting investor seed money at the beginning to sell a project that you can sell significantly more copies of later on. I'm totally with you. And I've been selling digitally direct since 2008, courses mm-hmm, and ebooks mm-hmm. and audio. But I'm also looking at Shopify for the print because they have these like plugins with Lulu yes. and other printers where you can do print um, direct. And so, yeah, I'm thinking of moving that. And, and similarly to you, I'm starting to think about doing like standalone audio I don't want to call them lectures, but just mm-hmm. standalone audio things on different topics that I would put up and and sell as they, it would be no book. It would just be a sort of audio extra me talking about particular topics and not a course, but just like right. it, back to the days of when we used to do this audio only product. And so, yeah, I feel the same way. And actually, I'm planning on releasing mine without the Kickstarter, but selling direct mm-hmm. only for maybe two weeks or even a month before I put it anywhere else as well in order to get that uh, upfront sale. So I think we're all starting to change our mindset, aren't we? To sort of let's take the chunk of sales ourselves before we put it out onto the stores. Right. And I think what people don't uh, also don't realize is let's say you're planning to sell the uh, book exclusively on Kindle Unlimited if you do what you're doing, Joe, and you sell it direct before anywhere else, you might be able to bank some wide, wide-ish sales by having it uh, sell directly on any platform, ag- am- Amazon agnostic, and then you eventually do launch it on Kindle, uh, Kindle Direct. Y- you can have both. You can have everything. You can have your cake and eat it too. It, it's it's a really great opportunity for people. Yeah, 
I really think that's where we're going. And it's funny because when I first came into this space, and you were only a few years behind me, but when I started mm-hmm. with the blogging and in 2008, 2007, this is what people were doing. This was before right. KDP. Uh, and, you know, so that's what we did. We all sold PDFs and everything mm-hmm. like that direct from our mm-hmm. websites. And then, of course, Amazon and Kobo and Apple, and they all launched their bookstores. And then people started buying, but that brought down the price so much. Whereas before those stores, we actually sold for decent amounts. So it is interesting that that's coming around again these days. But I do want to ask you, as you said, we could have our cake and eat it too, but there is a little bit of the cake that I think might be impacted. So you teach Amazon ads and you understand how the algorithms work. And one of the things we do is we talk about the also boughts and we talk about how it's important to target your books to people who buy other books like yours. And in that way, it kind of helps the algorithm know who your readers are and all of that. But if we are creaming off a percentage of our existing readers who are that target audience, how will that impact Amazon ads, for example, if we've taken away the bulk of initial sales? And that is definitely something that needs to be considered. I think that when you uh, do skim off the top a little bit with these other sales methods, it is something that you will not have that flood of initial buyers from your email list to uh, from your email list first, your own followers, and then eventually the, the people who just find out about it in launch week, you won't necessarily have that, which could affect your also bots, which could affect things initially. But at the same time, we cannot just assume Amazon is going to solve all of our problems. And I like Amazon. I'm glad that we've had all these wonderful opportunities through uh, the KDP platform and through Amazon ads. But we have to be open to the, the future, as you're always talking about, the future of this industry. And I think that it is not necessarily going to be just selling the bulk of our books on one platform. But in order to make sure you still get the most out of your Amazon ads, you just need to get all your ducks in a row. Sales page, the cover, the title, the book description, subtitle, everything needs to be very clear. Yes, this is for this particular subgenre. If you read this subgenre, you'll like it. And you want to do everything you can with your seven KDP keywords, the categories you choose. And you can still ask your readers to go and leave a review on the book on Amazon when it launches, even if they happen to read it not on Amazon. So you still have some things in your control to steer the algorithm in your direction. Yeah. And at the end of the day, to me, it's like you mentioned briefly, when we sell direct, I mean, when I sell direct, even right now, it, the money's in my bank account within minutes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I much prefer money in my bank account within minutes than anything I do with the algorithm later. So I am I think the selling direct is, you know, in these times of inflation and we all need the cash flow. I yeah. mean, who knows how much that money will be worth in 60 to 90 days. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Oh, fun, fun times. Okay. So let's talk about some of your other streams of income. Cause I feel like, so we met almost a decade ago. It must've mm-hmm. been around then. And, and you've pivoted a number of times along the way. And you had a daughter as well, which kept you busy for sure. But uh, what I think is important, I mean, so often there's a discussion in the author community about books being the main thing and the only thing, but of course, many of us choose other things. So like this podcast for me is an income stream as well as book marketing. So Mm -hmm. tell us about some of your other sides of your business and and how you decided or why you decided to expand yourself beyond books. Absolutely. In the beginning, like you said, it was pretty much just books. I had my nonfiction books and some fiction books. And I really did think that maybe this could be enough, but the ups and downs of book sales, even back in 2012, 2013, it made me realize there had to be there had to be other options. So originally, 
I was doing freelance. I was doing freelance on the side. I, I even scored a fun gig doing freelance, pretending to be ghostwriting these CEO articles for Forbes and Fast Company and whatnot. And that was a lot of fun. But that eventually pivoted into something where I had more control over it. So that became the best page forward book description business, as we talked about back in 2015 on this show. And that business turned into helping authors with other service areas. So service is definitely one thing you can provide. We were writing book descriptions. Now we're also doing the uh, category and keyword research, the metadata and book covers. And so we're doing all of that now with uh, Best Page Forward Plus. That's the service side. There's also the course side. You can have a course. And uh, long ago, I had the course Selling for Authors, which was great and covered a lot of different things, but ended up niching down to the Amazon ads. And now we have the author ad school teaching ads. And so we have the course side of things. If you know how to do something well, you can create a course around it. And then number three is the coaching. I think that these are kind of the three main areas I tend to think of uh, side income, but coaching allows you to one-on-one or you to a group of people to teach even deeper and to help guide people through challenges they might not have been able to do on their own. We have this ongoing every quarter mastermind that we do through the author ad school. And originally it was all me. And eventually I did, I did uh, hire three uh, wonderful folks to take over the coaching side for me. And that was really hard to give that up because I really do love coaching, but it was time for money. And that is one of the challenges with all of this stuff is can you make it so that you aren't just working for $10 an hour, $20 an hour, $30 an hour? Can you have some things where you are not spending all of your time to make them work? And a lot of that has to do with hiring and outsourcing and delegating. And that is a huge part of having multiple streams of income so that you aren't watching each individual one like a hawk. Yeah. And I know that you've struggled with this over the years because, and I also, well, I've struggled with it and have stepped back a, back from it. You struggled mm-hmm. with it and stepped into it. So yes. you have basically, you have scaled your businesses and you do have, so you have a team of copywriters at Best Page Forward as well, right? You don't personally right. write everyone's descriptions. <laughs> I used to. I, I know used you to. did. I know you did. But th- so this is, I guess this is my question. And I have, I really do have this question because I have failed at it, which is, so if we want to scale our income, as you say, past a certain point, you have to hire people. So what were some of your biggest challenges with hiring and finding the right people, I guess? And, and how did you make it through those initial feelings of, oh, I can just do it better? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, at first, I hired friends. And, and I think there were positives and negatives to that. A couple of those friends are still with my company four or five years later. So it certainly wasn't all bad. I didn't follow the the advice of never hire your friends because it actually uh, did work out and being kind to them and being understanding to them was always a good way of making that work. Uh, Then I did start to try to hire people who I was not familiar with. And so I Uh, accepted resumes and did interviews and asked questions. And I definitely got it uh, uh, not wrong per se, but I didn't find the perfect fit at first with that process because I had to get better at it. I had to get better at hiring. You're not automatically going to be able to hire someone who is an expert and who fits perfectly with you, you need to work on it. I actually think that one of my levels for the email marketing Kickstarter is going to be specifically about hiring someone to run your emails, because that is something that I think every author wants. 
and very few authors know how to do. And a lot of that comes down to not just asking people questions and hoping you're a good fit. I've had people do personality tests, Myers-Briggs and the Clifton Strengths Finder. I've had people do sample tasks before I hire. I will have multiple people do a sample task so that I can see their work in action. And it, before I did that, it, it was just hoping for the best. But once I started to really refine my hiring process, it became a lot easier. But the, the last thing I want to put out here, and this one I don't hear talked about very often, but I have really loved this idea of looking at my fans and my people who are advocates for me and folks who just really love the courses and services I offer and maybe have bought those courses and services in the future, in the past, asking them if they want to work with me. And that has been my best option. That has been the, the people who are already on board with kind of the message and the mission of the business, because they're a part of it from the customer side, they have loved being a part of the actual business. And I think that people who I've hired through that way, I've had an 80 to 90% retention rate on those folks for years. And I love working with them and we have a great time. And then they learn actually even better by being on the inside. So that I think is my best tip. Mm. Yes. Well, that's how I found Alexandra. He's my virtual assistant and has mm -hmm. been for goodness, like eight years or something at this point. Mm. <laughs> but nice. no, I totally agree there. So are these people on your payroll or is it freelance? All freelance right now. Everyone is a, a part-time person, part-time contractor, and there's definitely labor laws that you need to follow, making sure that people are paid for meetings. You need to certainly uh, make sure everything is done right with your accountant. I did not always have an accountant. I'm glad that I got one <laughs> for this sort of thing. <laughs> and you just need to make sure everything is above the board and that you're doing everything the right way. I don't think I worried about it as much when I had one person, but now that I have about 25 people, I, I do need to pay attention to making sure I'm doing everything correct uh, on, on that side. And then, of course, you're also uh, the co-host of the Sell More Book Show, but you're kind of the primary host, really, because you did it with Jim Kukrol since 2014. Claire H. Claire Taylor, right, is your yes. co-host now. So you've got the podcast and you're still weekly. I mean, you guys, right. yeah, you do a great job. Podcasting takes a lot of time and it's obviously great for marketing. You mentioned there's building a community and it's great for community and it can be for income as well. But what part does that podcast play for you in your your business. Right. Well, we did have a Patreon. I think I might have followed the lead of you and, and Mark Dawson and some other folks wading into Patreon. And it was going well for us. We we were paying for our show notes person, Roland. We were paying him through the Patreon and everything was going well with it. But we didn't feel like everyone was getting as much value as I really want to be able to give. And I didn't feel like we were able to work it into me and Claire's schedule to, to, to help the pat patrons. I know that you do your Q and A's and you give these wonderful things to your patrons. I didn't feel great about it. So that was the main direct way we were making money from sell more book show. And we took it down and I'm pleased with that decision. Cause I feel really good about now. I don't have this thing where uh, people have bought a thing from me and aren't getting value. The, the value thing is very, very important to me. And so now the ways that we get value out of the podcast are all indirect. New people finding out about us, people finding out about if, if Claire has a new offer for some of her craft writing stuff through her company, FFS Media. And if I have a new thing or a new webinar, I can talk about it on the show. And our show, we don't really do ad reads very long. We just say, hey, we have a thing. And then we move into the content. But I think that we don't always have to get the direct 
actual ads from the show. I think you certainly can. Uh, and as, certainly if you have a large enough audience, but it's totally okay to just get the indirect benefits from something as well, to have something that it makes you present in the community. And for me, like it's easy, it would be easy to just be in my high tower as CEO of Best Page Forward and not pay attention to what's going on in the industry. Sell More Book Show forces me every week to know what's going on so that I am, am able to be in touch with the struggles that beginner authors are facing. And that value is that intangible value of the knowledge is huge for me. Mm, it's also our interest, isn't it? Because I'm the same. I just like knowing what's going on and interested in the news and, and things. Although I don't cover the news that you do, because I feel like yeah. we serve different niche. Well, not we serve a similar niche, but I yeah. cover a different kind of angle. But then we're, we're almost done. But I wanted to circle back to your fiction and your comedy, because I feel like the Brian I first met a decade ago, you <laughs> I don't think you were married. You certainly didn't have a baby who's now right. a child. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. And you've moved house, I think. You moved across the country. There's been a lot of change in your personal life. And I feel like you kind of had to accelerate your business because you had a lot of life going on as well. Yes. Um, so that fiction side of you, the comedy side of you, I almost feel like you've put that aside for a lot of the business stuff. How are you still serving that part of you? Or is it put aside for now and it's something you're going to come back to? So one of the ways I've tried to still use this, and and I think it's been a few years, certainly, since I've really done any specific comedy, but the ways I'm trying to scratch that itch, I decided early on in the process for that self-publishing and Amazon ads book, and now that's kind of part of a series with these self-publishing books, I decided they weren't just going to be like one of my old books where I just had a little bit of comedy mixed in with with the education. I decided I was going to use half of the book to tell an almost allegorical story in in fiction style, narrative style, with essentially me working with a student, helping them through the challenges. I have that in uh, the self-publishing with Amazon ads. I have that in the new self-publishing and email marketing book where I'm working with a student and we get to have fun. I get to have fun conversations with this student as the author. And I get a lot of comedy out of that. In the first book, the student think kind of thinks I'm full of crap. And so it's really fun to have that kind of banter in this, yes, nonfiction book. And so I get to scratch that comedy itch that way. And then the other way, it's silly, but TikTok. I'm doing TikToks. I'm <laughs> That's recording That's perfect them. for you, though. That's I know. perfect. <laughs> I know. I, I'm doing the edutainment of the education and the entertainment there on TikTok. We're doing a, about three a day while we're recording this one. And so I do have my fun a little bit with that. Oh, that's good. And it does really suit you as a platform and with the comedy and the the performance side. It totally does not suit me at all. So I just haven't gone <laughs> no. anywhere near it. But it's yeah, it was it was made for 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 you. So that's brilliant. And I, I'm not gonna have a look because I don't even have TikTok, but I'm sure lots of other yeah. people will. <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. Oh, this is great. Right, so tell us, where can people find you and everything you do, including the new Kickstarter? Sure. Well, the new Kickstarter, it will be at kickyouremail.com. So if you go to kickyouremail.com prior to June 30th. uh, 2022. 2022. I was going to say it. 2022, uh, you will be able to back the campaign and get the self-publishing and email marketing book with all of the really fun extra perks that go in there, including an email challenge, because I, I love challenges. And so that is the Kickstarter. You can certainly listen to me and Claire every week for the Sell More Book Show podcast at sellmorebookshow.com and wherever you listen to that sort of stuff. And I've still got my quarterly ad challenges for Amazon ads over at authorsadvertise.com. And you can check that out. The next one will be in July, 2022. (laughs) And so a lot of stuff going on, but 
thank you again, Joe. I I hope it's not another five years, but if it is, that's okay. I, I'm very happy to be on your show. Oh, thanks so much, Brian. That was great. So I hope you found the interview with Brian interesting, whether you're doing a Kickstarter or if you're interested in scaling your business or creating other streams of income. And remember, you can catch Brian over at the Sell More Book Show podcast if you want the news and the tips every week. Now, next week, I'm talking to Katie Cross about selling books direct through Shopify. Yes, uh, as I build my own Shopify store, I wanted to talk to Katie. And we talk about really turning the business model on its head from sending our traffic to Amazon and the other stores to focusing on encouraging readers to buy from us directly and using our email lists in a more active way. It almost feels to me like a return to what many of us did pre sort of 2010, which is direct e-commerce from our websites. And of course, we have so many tools now. And and I, I believe in being absolutely wide, having things everywhere, but exciting times indeed. And as I mentioned in my intro, I have a lot more to come on this. I'm just organizing my thoughts and my plan. And the interview with Katie certainly helped. So happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.